Hello, everyone. My name is Minji Chen. I'm an assistant professor of electrical engineering at Princeton University. Today, it's my pleasure to talk about some of the work that my group has been working on for extreme performance power electronics and power conversion architecture. We know that there are a lot of opportunities and challenges in power electronics. Uh, the white band gap semiconductor devices that we're using now is much smaller and faster than the silicon devices we used in the past. However, passive components are still dominating the overall system and volume. Uh, switching at high frequencies will allow us to reduce the energy storage requirements and reduce the passive component size, but there are a lot of limitations of switching at high frequencies, for example, switching loss, core loss, material property, and parasitics. So we need better solutions to, uh, in addition to switching higher switching frequency to enable us to push towards extreme performance. Here at Princeton, we look at a complex power electronics design and the systems uh, to enable uh, very high performance power electronics. We look at new materials, uh, including semiconductor devices and uh, magnetics. We look at new architecture with a focus on modular, scalable, and reconfigurable architectures. And we, look, we aim at both improving the overall system performance, increasing the frequency density, bandwidth, stability, and also enable new functions uh, in, in emerging applications. So in he, today's presentation, we're going to go through uh, two design examples for complex power electronics. One is uh, so-called complex design, uh, about how do we use hybrid switch, switch past the power conversion architecture for extreme performance, 48 volt to one volt CPU volt regulators. We're also talking about the complex methods. How do we use machine learning to model many core loss, uh, including how do we build a large scale database and develop neural network models for modeling the many core loss at high frequencies. So let's start from uh, power electronics for future computing. We know there's a massive demand in future computing. The transistor power density is rapidly growing. The processor die area is continuously expanding and we're putting more and more microprocessors on the server motherboard. So in this graph, I'm showing the core power density uh, increasing from about 0.2 watts per millimeter square about 20 years ago uh, to over 4.5 watts per millimeter square right now. Uh, and the processor die area has increased from below 200 millimeter square to over 600 millimeter square. So this translates to over two kilowatts per core per microprocessor. And we're putting many of these microprocessors on a server motherboard, putting a lot of challenge into power electronics design. So in here at Princeton, we focus on this merge two stage 48 to one voltage regulation modules. So we adopt these series input and parallel output configuration uh, in which we have many of these switch passes circuits in connected in series to divide the high voltage into multiple smaller voltage domains. And then we have this meaning of these multi-phase buck units connected in parallel to handle a very high current on the output side. Uh, we also integrate meaning of these discrete inductors in the multi-phase buck converter as one single high frequency multi-phase couple inductor, which allow us to balance performance in steady state and transient. Uh, so by combining these switch capacitor units together with multi-phase block, we also enable this soft charging capability, which allow us to run the switch capacitor circuits at low frequency with low switching loss and without sacrificing a charge sharing loss and rerun this multi-phase block at high frequency to get high control bandwidth. So in overall, very high level, what we're doing is we use these series stack switch capacitor units to deal with the voltage stress, we use multi-phase buck units to deal with the current stress, and we use this couple inductor to give us very high, very fast uh, dynamics response. Uh, and this is just one example of how do we use uh, distributed modular power conversion architecture to push for extreme system performance. So by going towards more complex power electronics, we also can leverage the benefits of uh, capacitive energy transfer and inductive energy transfer. We know capacitors offer very, very high power density as compared to inductors. So with the same volume, the capacitors can deliver more than 100 times more energy uh, than inductors, but there are many problems with inductors for, or with capacitors. For example, we cannot regulate the output voltage. So adding a little magnetics will give us opportunity of enabling a lot of very useful functions. Uh, for example, we need uh, current source behavior and as a result, we usually need some inductors. And in the voltage regulation module, we also need to deal with the challenge between steady state and dynamics. 
So in steady state, we want the inductance to be high so that uh, we can reduce the current ripple and improve our system efficiency. And in transient, we want inductance to be low so that we can get very fast dynamic speed. So this couple inductor give us this opportunity that we, uh, when during a steady state behavior, we can run the meaning phases in uh, differential mode or in the leaving so that we can effectively get high inductance and greatly reduce the current ripple. And in common mode, the common mode system behavior uh, actually has very low inductance so that we can get very fast uh, transient speed. And combining switch capacity units together with switch inductor units also give us soft switching and a soft charging opportunity. Uh, and as a result can allow us to get high efficiency and high power density. So here's an example circuit that we have been looking at, and we call it Lego point of load linear extendable group operated point of load architecture, where we have this main granular building blocks to build high current uh, 48 volt one voltage regulation modules. So we have many of these switch paths to circuits connected in series on the input side, and many of these block units connected in parallel on the output side. Uh, so on the right hand side is the example circuit topology. We have 48 volt coming in, uh, divided into three by three series stacked submodules, each handling 16 volts. So there's a two to one switch passer units converting 16 volt into eight volts with very high efficiency. And we have these multi-phase buck units converting eight volt to one volt with very high control bandwidth. So a few very interesting and important features of this architecture is that it can offer automatic voltage balancing, benefiting from the voltage balancing mechanism of the switch capacitor units. Uh, it can get automatic current sharing uh, coming from the multi-phase buck and a couple of inductors. Uh, it also has very uniform uh, power conversion stress across the semiconductor devices. So we automatically distribute the thermal stress, make the heat sink design much easier. This is very important for these high current designs. Uh, it's a we can use uh, state of art current mode control because the second stage is a standard multi-phase buck converter. And finally, the system is fully modular and highly extendable. We can linearly extend the number of units in your switch capacitor units and uh, to get to handle higher input voltage and uh, extend the number of units in the buck units to handle higher output current. So recently, there are a lot of discussions on vertical power delivery to microprocessors. Essentially, we can stack the power electronics vertically together with the processor to reduce the interconnect length, to reduce the loss, and uh, to enable better signal integrity. Uh, Intel has proposed this power via technology where we can deliver signal from the top of the silicon and power from the bottom of the silicon to the microprocessors. And the Tesla Dojo is really integrating, vertically integrating the heat sink the microprocessor die and the power electronics together. So in our group, we also use a uh, vertical power delivery concept. Uh, what we're doing is we're actually using the magnetics as a part of the packaging to uh, deliver power from the motherboard to the microprocessor in a vertical way. So we have these two piece couple inductor magnetic structure. We put it top and bottom and we 3D print the metal windings and then winding coming in from the bottom of the core wrapping around the legs for 90 degree and going towards the top. So the overall transient uh, or leakage inductance of the couple inductor is about 12 nano Henry and the steady state or magnetic inductance of the, uh, of the uh, couple inductor is 85 nano Henry. So it represents about seven times uh, ripple reduction for the CM, uh, CM uh, transient behavior, or uh, this can be translated to seven times smaller inductive energy storage for the CM Repo performance. So on the right hand side is the assembly process. We have two cores and four windings, and the wind is getting in to the core from the bottom uh, and then get out from the core from the top. So here is the 3D packaging of the vertical power delivery system. So we have the couple inductors uh, taking power from the 48 volts. Uh, it sits uh, on the bottom with the capacitors. And then we have these multi phase buck units. Uh, we implement with the docking MOS, uh, driver MOS devices. Uh, and then we have these uh, vertical four phase coupled inductor delivering power from bottom to top. And then finally we have the output capacitors on the top. So on the very right hand, this is uh, demonstrating the prototype together with the Intel microprocessor. Uh, the overall system volume is 46 millimeter by 16 millimeter by 16 millimeter. 
So this is our uh, experimental setup. So we have uh, meters, multimeters standing on the top to measure the efficiency. We have the DC sources supplying power at 48 volts. Uh, we have this device on the test. Our prototype sits in here uh, on the measurements for efficiency and power density. We have two uh, electronic loads um, taking sinking um, 780 amps. So this is the prototype in my one of my students' hands. Uh, he has a regular hand, so it's like you can see how small the the, the device is compared to a US US quarter. Uh, the overall this is a converter operating waveforms. Uh, in air cooling, uh, the system is capable of de de delivering 450 amps uh, to one volts uh, with a efficiency of um, about 93% with 1.8 volt, 1.5 volts and about 90% at 0.8 volts. And if we use liquid cooling uh, by controlling, managing the temperature of the device below 95 degree, uh, the system can deliver over 780 amps of current. So as far as I know, this is the first demonstration of a 48 volt voltage regulation module achieving over one amps per millimeter square in terms of current density and over 1,000 watt per cubic inch for power density. And this is our the comparison of our system compared to other state of art industry and academia design. And we achieve over three times better uh, power density and we break the one amper millimeter square records. So what do we learn from this design? So we, we use a hybrid switch class the magnetic circuit topology with many, many switches. But if we look at the weight breakdown and volume breakdown, we can find that the switches only contribute to 4% of the weight and 2% of the volume. And magnetic capacitors and copper and printed circuit boards are, are dominating overall system volume. So even if we are very aggressively using very complicated system topology and architecture, there's still a huge room for us to improve. So we are continually pushing to, towards more complex architecture with more semiconductors, and hopefully that will allow us to greatly reduce the size of the magnetic capacitors and reduce the size of our overall system volume. And this project is in collaboration with Google, Intel, and Dartmouth College. So this is an example of the design. So how about methods? So we'll give, I'll give you another uh, example project that are going on in our group. Uh, we develop more complex methods, and in this case, machine learning for modeling magnetic coils. And we'll talk about the large scale database construction and the neural network models that we have, we have been testing for, for modeling coils under a variety of different uh, excitations. So modeling magnetic core loss is not a new topic. There are many existing methods for modeling core loss, including stamage equation, improved stamage equation, improved improved stamage equation. Uh, and fundamentally what we're doing is we're using more and more parameters to capture the sophisticated behavior of magnetic material, especially at high frequencies and under different DC bias and temperature environments. So the idea of this project is to, can we use machine learning methods and use thousands of parameters in a neural network to capture the sophisticated nonlinear behaviors of magnetic core. So a very, every machine learning model start from data. So we, first of all, we build a automatic data acquisition system comprising an oscilloscope, a host computer, a power stage, a device on the test and a current shunt. So what we can do is we can automatically generate many, many different types of waveforms at different frequencies with different flux density, DC bias, and under different temperature, and then automatically record the waveform and create a database. So here is our uh, uh, experimental setup, which is, you know, which is capable of generating many, many different types of waveforms and automatically store the data. Uh, and in the end, right now, what we can do is we can do about 1.2 seconds per data or translate to over 3000 data uh, per hour. So we built this database uh, with four types of waveforms, sinusoidal, triangle, trapezoidal, and asymmetric trapezoidal. And we tested on five materials uh, with different excitations. Uh, the frequency range right now we can cover is from 550 kilohertz to 500 kilohertz. Uh, with the flux density range from 20 millitesla to 300 millitesla. We have collected over 60,000 data points uh, and our equipment, as I said, is capable of doing 1.2 seconds per data. Uh, and here I'm visualizing the measured core loss with frequency against the power loss and flux density against the power loss uh, with different due to ratios of 
triangle waveforms, and you can see that they're very interesting nonlinear uh, patterns sitting there. And that's what we want machine learning model uh, to capture for us. So we go ahead and build machine learning uh, neural networks. Uh, we select the basic neural network, uh, which is a three layer fit forward neural network. We switch the uh, sweep the network size. We use Optuna to uh, tune the network parameters and we compare its results against IGSE. So here you can see the example. Uh, so we have IGSE. Uh, the accuracy of uh, IGSE is actually highly depends on how do we, uh, how do you get the parameters of IGSE. And here we're using a global IGSE, meaning that we're using the CM, uh, K, alpha, and beta to represent the materials across the entire frequency and Fox density range. And IGSE accuracy is about 15% uh, across different materials. Well, for neural network, uh, if we use a very simple neural network, the accuracy is worse. But if we go to more complex neural networks, we can greatly reduce the overall system accuracy. But keep in mind, we want to avoid overfitting uh, while we're increasing the neural network size. And on the bottom, I'm visualizing the performance of three types of neural network. And you can see that as the size of the neural network grow, the model accuracy gets more and more accurate. That's sort of what we expect uh, from, from theoretical analysis. So uh, we also explore these transfer learning methods for coalesce modeling. So the question is, what can we do if we need to predict a coalesce for new material with a limited amount of data? So what we can do is actually we can use a large scale existing database for uh, materials that we have, uh, with which we have carefully measured and we have a large scale database to pre-train a neural network, which may not offer very good accuracy for a particular material, but can capture the general behavior of the core loss. Then if we have a new material with, uh, with data that is not that accurate, uh, but it's actually it's sort of representing the overall system behavior of the new material, we can train the pre trend network with a small amount of new data so that we can fine tune the network for this new particular material. And we have, have proof that uh, by doing this, we can get much, much better accuracy compared to if we train a neural network from scratch with the new data. So here I'm showing a few examples. The first graph is we use a pre-trained model to a new material without retraining. Uh, so you can see that the core loss is very inaccurate uh, predict from model because model never see the new material before. And then after we train a model, uh, retrain a model uh, with the small data sets, we can get fairly good accuracy. You can see that the core loss match, the measured core loss match pretty well with the predicted results. Uh, so in, in, in order to compare the performance and showcase the effectiveness of these methods, uh, what we can do is we can randomly initiate the model uh, and then train it with the small data. And you can see that the model is very inaccurate because we didn't use the pre-trained model. Uh, and if we use a large amount of data, that of course, uh, and train from scratch, of course, we can get very good results, but these will require a very large amount of data sets. So what we want to say here is that transfer learning will allow us to uh, leverage all the existing large scale data sets for many different magnetic materials and train a, a genetic neural network which can be retrained to gain reasonably good accuracy with a very small, of, small amount of new data as compared to uh, either you train uh, from scratch with small data and get very inaccurate results, or you train a new neural network which require a large amount of data. So we automate everything and we actually build a website uh, for visualizing our data. So you can actually go to the, go to the website and then uh, <clears throat> check the core loss of the five different materials on the variety of different excitations. And we also have online prediction uh, functions, uh, which is developed based on machine learning, where you're putting the waveform information and you can predict the core loss. So the entire project is open source in GitHub and it support supported by Streamlight and sponsor is uh, APAE and, uh, and Princeton Center for Statistics and Machine Learning. So in summary, uh, in this seminar, we talked about uh, many of the ideas that we have uh, uh, in, in developing complex electronics for extreme performance. Uh, we talked about complex design and we use a hybrid switch cluster power conversion architecture as an example to talk to uh, develop extreme performance CPU volt regulators. 
We also talk about complex methods, essentially how do we use many, many parameters uh, to capture sophisticated magnetic core loss behavior. And in this particular case, we're using machine learning for modeling magnetic core loss. We build a database and develop neural network models, which can beat traditional methods and enable us to do uh, new functions such as applying transfer learning to model magnetic core loss. So if you're interested, you can check out our papers. Uh, there are much, much more details uh, and there are many other similar projects that are going on uh, in our group. So with this, uh, I want to conclude my talk and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.